Welcome to the YouTube channel for Bible Biker Church in Rockwood, Tennessee. I am Fred Marshall, Elder and Associate Pastor. We pray that what you're about to see is inspiring to you as it is the truth in the Word of God as it is written. We pray that it blesses you and anyone that you share it with. If you like what you see, please click on the like button and subscribe to our channel. Also know that you can find us on Facebook under the page name Bible Biker Church. Thanks and have a blessed day. All right, well, good evening, ladies. Short crowd in here tonight, but uh, still good. That's okay. Yeah. Being out for the last few weeks has got everybody off schedule, so it'll, it'll pick back up. Yeah, it will. Uh, tonight we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we may get through all of it. We may get through half of it. We'll see. Uh, there's a couple things in there that are pretty important. But I want to remind you where we were the last time we met. We did 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and you got to remember, Corinth is a city of many different cultures, many different ways of life, many different religions, and there's all kinds of um, what we consider immoral acts that goes on there, uh, especially the temples of the goddesses and stuff like that. Yeah. So Paul is writing back to the church because he had heard that some of the members of the church were getting reinvolved in some of that type of activity. So he wrote them and he said, "Look, you got to you got to straighten up. You know this is not right." Chapter five specifically calls out one person in the church at Corinth that is sleeping with his father's wife, and he said that is such an immoral thing that not even the pagans do that. So they said you have to kick that guy out of church. And when we get into 2 Corinthians later on, we'll find out that he rewrites that section and says that he yelled at them with the right intention, but now that that situation is, is corrected, we need to move on. Okay, so he, he'll come back to that later. But at the end of chapter 5, there was also some information that, that was pretty important. He said, I wrote in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexual immoral of the world or the greedy or the swindlers, the idolaters, since they would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of a brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or as an idolater or a viler, a drunkard, a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what I have to do with judging outsiders, is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge because God judges the outside but he says purge the evil person from among you they're starting to lose focus on how to operate as a as a as a body of Christ not only are they having immoral actions they're starting to cheat each other they're starting to swindle they're, they're starting to uh, just be no good at all and he's calling them out on it. And chapter 6 is going to go right back into that. It's going to cover more sexual immorality stuff, but it's also going to start charging them with specific things. There are five sexually uh, explicit things he's going to call out and five non-sexually explicit things he'll call out that they need to stop doing in their church. Okay? So that's where we're going to be tonight is 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let me go ahead and open this up in a word of prayer, and we'll get right back into it. Heavenly Father, Lord God, again, we thank you for this place that you've given us, a platform to stand on where we can speak your word in truth and in love, but Lord, so that the people understand exactly what it is that you want from us. Father, I ask you to come and be with us now. Lord, just put your words in my mouth. Let this come out the way you want it to, not as I would have it, Lord. Father, I just praise your name and everything you're doing to us, through us, and for us in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we're going to start this off, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, like I normally do in the ESV, the English Standard Version. But there are a couple of verses that I'll change and do in the King James because the words look really different. And I need to explain why. But here in the beginning, in chapter 6, verse 1, it says, When one of you... Now, stop right there. Um, as a matter of fact, in the King James, it says, dare you. That's how serious this is. 
But it, notice he says, when one of you, not if one of you, or you know, uh, if, if this comes to pass, but he says, when one of you, knowing that this will happen, when one of you has a grievance against another inside the church, one person inside the church with another person inside the church, does he dare go to the law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? So if a person who has a grievance, uh, uh, let's, let's say someone stole something from them or someone argued with them or hurt them somehow, and there's a grievance with them, what Paul is saying is why, why do you take it out to the public before taking it to the church? Take it to the church. That's what he wants them to do. Yeah. Because God's rule is more, more important than man's rule. And we have to follow man's law. That's true. But if it's a case where we can sell it inside the church, do that. So it says, <clears throat> Satan verse 2, Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? What in the world does that mean? How will the saints judge the world? You got to step back and look. Paul's talking long term here. Okay, when the end of the world comes, and we are taken up in spirit with Jesus, the rapture, then Satan will come and he'll rule the world for a period of time, and then the second coming happens. And after that second coming happens, all of the evil will stand and face the. Uh, great white throne of judgment. And in that throne of judgment will sit the saints who will preside over the proceedings against the angels that fell. And you have to understand how important that statement is. Remember, God said that man is above angels. Right? Well, they didn't like that. As a matter of fact, that's one of the things that Lucifer did. He got mad and got prideful, and he took a third of the angels with him when he, when he fell out of heaven. So in the end, the saints will sit in judgment on those angels. Okay? That's what he's talking about here. And if the world is judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Why go to a civil court to try to get $5 back from somebody that didn't buy your gas? Why not go to the church and say, this person has done me wrong, bring them to church, accuse them of it, and have it fixed. If it's not fixed in the church, there's another step to go on beyond that. There's a whole process to follow. But the thing is, is you do it in the church. You don't do it in the public. We don't need that, that problem out there in the public. Do you not know that there, do you not know that we are to judge angels? Remember I told you a moment ago, at the, at the time of the great white throne of judgment, we will be sitting over and presiding over the, the uh, charges against the angels. How much more than the matters pertaining to this life? Now, there's obviously some things that they can't do in church. Murder, um, child abduction, you know, things that are, have to involve the law. We understand that. But like I say, these are just petty things he's talking about. Yeah. These are not... <laughs> big issues. These are just petty things. So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? The majority of the people that ran the public court system were just regular Roman citizens. It was in the middle of the marketplace. It was an open court. They, they made a spectacle out of it. If you came and charged somebody, everybody knew your business. Everybody. Okay? Yeah. I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? Can't you just work it out? That's what he's saying. You know, just, just, just work it out, whatever it is. Whatever you have done to someone, go to them and ask for forgiveness. Work out whatever the payment is and get it over with. But don't take them to court. Don't take them out into the public. So in other words, anything that you can settle without going to court, you can't stand around that. that. That is the way it's supposed to be done biblically. That is correct. Okay. But brothers go to the law against brother, and that before unbelievers. 
the court system does not, at this point in time, does not have any relationship with God whatsoever. Now, in the U.S. it's different, but you got to remember this is in Rome, you know, in the in the first century, right? So they have zero, you know, do you tell the truth, the whole truth, the truth of God? They don't have any of that. They just say, say what you got to say, and we'll figure something out. So that. In the U.S., that's part of our yeah. Constitution. Okay. That's the, it, the, we were built on Christian values here. Yeah, and actually, just where in the Bible, why, or is it okay to do that? The, the, there's verses in here that says that you should not do that, but that's a different understanding of what was happening at the time. Okay. But yes, it's okay to do that. I'm just trying to understand that. Yeah, no, it's it's absolutely fine. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. If you can't settle it, if you can't ask for forgiveness and get past this, you've already failed. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? If you can't settle it, if the person has gotten away with something, why not just turn and forget about it? Why let it consume your life? Why let it make you want them in public to be? It seems like that would make you real miserable and sick. Not if you just turn it over to God and let Him deal with it. Yeah, that's when you cast out your burdens. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. So he's talking to the ones who have been defrauded and say you also defraud others. You have been wronged, but you wronged somebody else. You have been wronged, but you've wronged somebody else. That's what he's saying. Yeah. Look, we got to get back to the core. we got to get back to being of one mind. Okay? Right. And this is where he's going to start going with this next statement. And he, it's gonna, This is where it's going to start getting interesting. So that whole section was about not going to public court to fix things inside the church. But now let's see what kind of people he's talking about. Do you not... Oh, and by the way, this is one of the most incorrectly used structures of, of Scripture. Okay, I'll explain that when we go through it. But in the ESV it says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Stop. Does that say that they will not be saved? No. It says they will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's a difference between being saved and getting to heaven and inheriting the kingdom of God. Remember all those treasures that you're storing up? That's the kingdom that you're going to receive to give back to Jesus. It doesn't say that they're not going to be saved. It doesn't say they're not going to heaven. It doesn't say that they are. All it says is, do you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And do not be deceived, neither the, and here he starts separating them, sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. He repeats that line again. But I want you to read this again. It says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not? Therefore, an unrighteous person will not inherit all that he has been afforded in heaven because he has not changed his ways. That's what that's saying. Do not be deceived. It's not just one group of people. And here's five sexual and five not sexual things. It says sexually immoral, Idolaters, and why would we put idolaters in the same thing as a sexual immorality? Is because remember where they are. They're in Corinth. They're in the Greek. Um, all the Greek gods have temples there, and all of the temples have prostitutes. Okay, all of the prostitutes have idols in their rooms. They pray to the idols when they're receiving the funds for what they do. So the idolaters and the sexually immoral are always tied together. Always nor adulterers, 
a person who cheats on their spouse, nor a man who practices homosexuality, nor, and here's where the five non come in, five, uh, not, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers. Okay, he just told them, now you've, you have wronged people in the church as well. So he's reminding them all of these things are bad. All of these things. But now I want to read those same things to you in the King James. And I want you to see the different words. Okay? These are the same verses. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Same sentence, right? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, which means having sex outside of marriage, nor idolaters, just like I said a second ago. They have those idols in the rooms. Nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Now, that's different. Notice it says, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves. The best way to explain it is a girly man. Those those that act more like women than they are they do men. Oh, okay. Doesn't mean that they're homosexual. It just means that they they may talk a certain way or they may walk a certain way or things like that. That's the effeminate. That's Doesn't, the only thing I didn't know. Yeah, that's okay. Then it says, "Nor the abusers of themselves with mankind." Those are prostitutes, male or female. Okay, that's what that means. So, so understand the difference here. It does not use the word homosexual in the King James. So you've got to go back to the Greek and try to figure out what that means. The Greek lexicon for the, the word that they come up with, effeminate and abusers of themselves, can be described as homosexual acts. The act itself, not the desire, not the, 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 the way you feel about yourself or anything like that. It's the actual act, the homosexual act. The sodomy, things like that. That can be translated that way. That's why it's so different. But people that claim that you've got to go by the King James will not even listen that it's it, it's the act that they're talking about. Not necessarily the way the person is. Okay. Thank you. Now, then we go to the next one. It says, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners. So we use the word swindlers in the... Um, uh, English standard, but extortioners, which is the same thing. I'm going to take something from you that I didn't earn. Whether I steal it from you or I force you to give it to me so that you don't get hurt. Or I just take it and steal it, right? Yeah. But none of those people shall inherit the kingdom of God. Once again, the inherit the kingdom of God. It doesn't say they won't enter the kingdom of God. And that's, that's a very sticking point with me because... I've had that verse thrown at me several times. Um, how could a person like this ever enter the kingdom of God? Because it says they will not enter. It doesn't say they won't enter. It says they will not inherit. There's a huge difference with that. Remember, Jesus came for anyone who called upon his name. So let's say that there is a person who is a murderer or a thief or a prostitute, and they call upon his name. Are they not saved? If they call, it says so. If they call upon His name, they are saved. Okay. Now watch, watch what happens though. And such were some of you. Now he's talking back to the people of Corinth. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So I just ask you, if a person with an immoral uh, lifestyle asks for forgiveness. Will he be? And he said, just like you were. Yeah. Yes. Okay? He so here's here's where here's where that, that wonderful argument that I love to have with people comes into play. I don't know the answer to this, but I'm going to give you the biblical truth about both situations. If Hitler asked for forgiveness from God before he died, where is he? He's in heaven. If Mother Teresa never asked for forgiveness from God, for Jesus to save her, where is she? In hell. How can Hitler, the destroyer of so many, be in heaven, and Sister Teresa, who did so many good things, not be in heaven? 
It has to do with their relationship with Jesus. So what he's saying, what Paul is saying is, look, some of you made a lot of mistakes before you were saved. So are these people. Now, once you're saved, the Holy Spirit starts changing you from the inside. What shows on the outside now should be that you are saved. So you shouldn't want to do those things anymore. Or if you do do those things, you'll start feeling bad about it and you'll want forgiveness for them right away. That's where the next verses are going. We'll stay in King James for now. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meaning that all of these things, whether against the law on the outside or just in the church, or whether they're not against the law in the church but against the law of the land, doesn't matter as long as they're not brought under the power of any. They can't have outsiders doing this. Now I'm going to go back and do the same verse in English Standard. It'll take me a second to get there. And such were some of you, but you were washed and you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Now Paul is putting the law back into play. Because remember... These, these were Jewish, some of them were Jewish people that had converted. Some of them are Gentiles that have converted. But all of them had rules and regulations they had to deal with before they were Christians, and now things are different. So now what he's calling back is you can't be enslaved by the law. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. What in the world could this one mean? Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. That's simple life, right? You have to eat to survive. But the Lord will destroy both. In the end, like the great white seat of judgment, we have no, no need for food. Our bodies are perfect. Our bodies are in line with God's and we're there to worship Him. Okay? The body is not meant for sexual immorality. The sexual immorality includes everything that is not designed for the marriage of a man and a woman. Any extramarital sexual affairs, adultery, any fornication outside of marriage, um, pre-marriage, um, anything, okay? That's all that's about. And he puts it all together in one sentence. Sex is designed for the marriage bed, period. Right. And the marriage bed is a man and a woman, period. Somewhere along the line, some men get it out on the next step. Right. But like my husband, <laughs> here. Yeah. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. So after we have passed and He's calling us home, or even if it's just time for the, for the, the taking up by the Spirit, then we're all going at once. Okay? Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Brother Will has been preaching on this a lot recently about each person being a member of the body of Christ. Some are the feet, some are the hands, some are the heart, some are the head. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Here's what he means by that. For those of the church that are sexually immoral, fornicators and adulterers, sex is for the marriage bed because it says when the Two become as one flesh. Well, if a person is going to a prostitute, the two are becoming one flesh outside of the marriage bed. 
That's making the body of Christ part of a prostitute. That's why we, we can't do that. We can't do that. Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to, to a prostitute becomes one body with her? Just like I just said. When two, when two people are having sex, they become one body. For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with Him. When we focus all of our energy, our spiritual, our sexual, our physical, our financial, all of it, when we focus it on Him, we become one big piece of the body. And that's it. So we have to keep that in focus. We can't, we can't become a rash on the body. We can't become a broken appendage on the body. We can't be something that they have to leave behind because of what we do outside of the body of Christ. Flee from sexual immorality. The, the case of Joseph comes up where he has done nothing wrong but the bride of the man who owns the, 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 the place where he's working tries to entice him into bed and he says no. So she starts screaming that he's trying to attack her, grabs his coat, and he flees without his coat. So now he's in trouble for her saying that he tried to attack her. So any of those situations flee from immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. If I steal something from you, that's outside of my body. If I shoot somebody, that's outside of my body. But if I go and have a relationship with somebody, that affects my body. Everybody okay with that? Everybody understands that? Well, when it affects my body, it affects the body of Christ. And we've seen it so many times where um, pastors or elders of churches have been caught up in sexual situations with people. Um, I was watching a fellow preach about this today. And he said he read that uh, there was one church where a fellow was brought up on 24 case, uh, charges of sexual immorality with 24 separate women in the church. Oh, I believe so, that. So. All right, then 19 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. The price that was paid was the blood of Jesus Christ. And we know that that's how we're saved. Through His grace and mercy that happened because of the cross and because of the resurrection, we have been healed spiritually by what He has done. We still have free will. We have to choose to be in line with God's work. We have to be. Two things about this passage. I said that they, they, people misuse um, verses 9 to 12 there about the um, homosexuality. It's not, it doesn't say homosexual in the King James. It does in the NIV and ESV. It's, it's, about, it's not about the, the person. It's about the acts of what they're doing because that Greek lexicon is an action word for that specific thing. So people try to use this and say that homosexuals can't get into heaven. They can if they repent. The whole thing is, do they repent? The other part of it is, they use the last section um, as, as a way to try to hold people accountable for things that they think versus what they do. And that's, that's wrong. It's, it's about the actions. What comes from the heart and what comes from the mind are not the same thing. I'll give you an example. It's, it's, a, it's a, a typical male example. But a pretty girl walks by and the eyes are diverted to them for just that second. There's nothing wrong with that. Right? That's a, that's a beautiful creation of God. But it's what the mind does and what the heart does. Does the mind dwell on that person as they walk by? And does the heart desire that person? Versus, well, that lady looks nice, and then you go back to what you're doing. See the difference? But there are people that want to hold us accountable 
to all of that as not being in line with the scripture, but that's not what that scripture says. It says to flee sexual immorality by looking at someone saying, oh, nice, and move on, not focusing on it, but if you do focus on it, you're not fleeing from it. Okay for him to lust after when he's going down the street? No, can't lust. Lust is the problem. Okay? Again, you see a very good looking man standing on the street corner. Your eyes look at him and go, wow, he's pretty, and then move on. Or do you say, wow, that guy, I'll, you know, I'd like to know him better? See the difference? The difference is, do you dwell on it, and what does your heart want? If it's just an, an admiration of someone that's nice looking, that's that's okay. But to go, wow, I wonder, you know, no, that's lusting, that's bad. Okay. okay? Everybody good with that? Questions? It'll be a short night. Because <coughs> that's it. That's all 20 verses of chapter 6. Do not hold in your heart issues with somebody. If you have an issue with somebody, work it out with them, in the church, with the elders. Unless it's some severe criminal activity, don't involve anybody else. Okay? The crowd that I was, was expecting tonight, I would have had some, you know, some teenagers in here and there would have been a lot more discussion about the sexual immorality. And, oh, there was these teenagers supposed to come tonight. But for whatever reason, they didn't, they didn't make it so. Anyway. You, you're not sure how to approach somebody about something. Then what do you do about that situation? Get advice from some, uh, Somebody. On the pastor's council, either ask the pastor, his wife, or the elder to help you with that situation. Okay? Well, then at that, this point, we'll go ahead and turn off the camera, and we'll do our personal private prayer request, and we'll have an early evening. So we'll see you guys next week.